so thrilled that you've chosen to join us here for this session this afternoon on giving in China and India, uh, 2.5 billion reasons to do better. Um, the session's goal is really for you to hear advice from on the ground experts. We can't thank our, our speakers enough for being here today, joining us at our CECP summit. Please you know, continue to get the snacks and then um, return to the tables. We'll do a little bit of small table discussion as part of our session. Um, what inspired this session really is something that Michael referenced in his comments, which is a, a new report CCP released last year on, called Giving Around the Globe. You've got some copies here. Um, it covers two new topics for CCP, which is how are companies from different regions different in how they give, and also what can we find out about international giving at the country level. So this is a new area for us, and you'll see why we were inspired to have this session. Um, based on what we found in this research. I'm just giving a quick sample and taste to talk about what we were inspired um, from this research to provide this session here at our summit. Um, one thing is that, not uh, completely surprisingly, companies from different regions are different <laughs> in how they execute their strategies. So you can see a common breakdown for CCP is what comes from corporate cash, what comes from foundations, and what comes from in-kind or non-cash. North American companies stand out incredibly in their proportion of non-cash giving. We use numbers to interpret into strategies. So what might this tell you in international giving strategy? Partners abroad may not be expecting the level of non-cash and in-kind contributions that is typically part of your relationships and strategy. So it's taking these numbers and converting them into how you might think about entering new markets. Where does corporate giving flow? These are the top 10 countries from 2012. And you will quickly see um, one of the inspirations for our session here is that India and China, with Canada kind of plunked right in the middle there, are the two countries where the highest percentage of companies are giving in 2012. Um, it's obviously, it's probably not a surprise to all those of you in the room as you're interested in these markets. But again, this is translating into strategy. Beyond our, our leaders in India and China, this may indicate markets that you want to look into. It also talks about how uh, international giving follows business strategy, which is where is uh, the international revenue, where are international employees, and how does giving lay against that. Um, so that was kind of the inspiration from our research on why we wanted to have this session here today. Um, and obviously, uh, China and India are not just in international giving news. If you saw the Forbes Global 2000 recent release, China is right next to the US, all throughout the top 10. Um, India in the news constantly about this new 2% CSR law. Um, obviously with the recent re elections, there's, there's possible changes to that as well. So we're so thrilled to have both of our panelists here to discuss all of this with us. The session is going to go uh, with some introductions of our panelists and uh, their organizations. They'll have a chance to make some opening comments. Um, we want to hear from you all what questions you'd like answered from our panelists here today. Um, I've got some questions for them. And then we'll open it up to the room. The way we'd like to open it up to the room is a quick discussion among your table to pick one question from the table to present to our panelists. We'll be rushing only slightly uh, because of our, our time schedule. So we're hoping we can finish around 4.15 to move on to the breakout sessions. And then, of course, the very important reception, which follows. So to make a brief introduction of both, I'd like to first introduce uh, Devil Sangabi, who is here from Dasra. He's the partner and co-founder of the organization, along with uh, Nira Nundi. Both worked at Morgan Stanley uh, over 10 years ago. And Morgan Stanley is here. I don't know if Joan Steinberg is in the room. Um, but alumni here that uh, started Dasra. And Devil specifically initiated the um, Dasra Philanthropy Week, as well as their giving circles, which are a really important part of their model. Um, Ms. Wang Ping joins us uh, from the uh, China Social Entrepreneur Foundation. She's the founder and the chairperson of the board and the secretary general of the organization, which is also known as YouChange. Um, sh her network is extremely wide and deep. I was quite impressed reading her biography to see how many different sectors she has touched in her history, as well as international experience. Um, so really well suited uh, to talk to us about the market in China with an understanding from her experiences working in the US and other places. She founded the China Social Entrepreneur so Foundation in 2007. Um, so the way I'd like to introduce your organizations, if the panelists are open to it, is to tell a little bit about what I understand from your organizations and then hear, you know, am I hitting the right points and how would you kind of respond to my uh, introduction of your organizations. So um, Devil, when I think of Dasra, there's two phrases that sort of stick out for me. And one is strategic philanthropy and one is empowering adolescent girls. 
Um, and when I first learned of DASRA, I thought, oh, perfect. This organization puts themselves forward, finds the most strategic nonprofits, and funnels funds to them. This is exactly what I hear companies asking us. How can we find high impact nonprofits in new markets? Um, as I learn more, I realize that there's that, and there's even more. There's advocacy and social change, um, training for civil sector leaders, and a whole new foray into CSR. Um, if I had to pick one number for DASRA, it would be 500, which is the number of successful <coughs> nonprofits that have been cultivated through your work. Um, so that would be kind of my summary, and I'd love to hear, Dave, how I did. Great, no, I think you did an excellent job. Um, you know, Dustra was formed 15 years ago with the goal of creating impact at scale. I think what many of you guys in this room realize that there were some phenomenal social organizations that existed, but many times they lacked the professional skills to really take their organizations to the next level. So we do quite a bit of work in terms of identifying these high impact organizations, and I think more importantly, post that is providing them with growth funding through collaboration with corporates, foundations, and high net worth individuals, and then providing those organizations with professional and managerial skills, enabling them to really take their model to the next level. Uh, I think it was great to see the awards earlier today, and you know, again, see the corporate and NGO partnerships that you guys highlighted, and, and how you know, this is just a great opportunity, I hope, with the CSR law that's been passed in India, for corporates to, again, work alongside existing organizations and enabling them to create greater impact. Okay, great. Um, and so, Ms. Wang, when I learned about the China Social Entrepreneur Foundation, my two terms for that would be uh, neo-philanthropy and platform. Because as I read your materials, those were two themes that came through very strongly in how you talk about your work. Um, it's a quite prestigious organization and very strong and with their roots in China and the development that you have of the sector. I have to say also, when I first began to learn, I thought of it uh, paralleling uh, an American community foundation. But I realized that something that our panelists have in common is that part of their mission is really about cultivating the NGO sector in their markets. It's something you share, probably done some ways similarly and some ways differently, but I think that that's, that's an interesting parallel to draw. Um, a focus on uh, poverty allevi alleviation and social change. And my number for China Social Entrepreneur Foundation would be 11 platform projects in how you organize your work around different platforms. So if you could uh, please let me know, how does that summarize China Social Entrepreneur Foundation and did I miss any important points you'd like to share? I have a few of your organization slides here if you want to make a few comments, and then we'll go to your opening okay. statement shortly after. So please. Oh, I, I yeah. agree. So uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, join, uh, join you in the significant uh, summit. And uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, uh, most of you choose, the, during the survey, most of you choose to have a uh, cooperation with the uh, nonprofit organization. So I hope when you go to China to cooperate, uh, to choose the cooperator and uh, choose the China Social Entrepreneur Foundation as your partner. <laughs> so why? Right, let me uh, tell you, uh, the name of Social Entrepreneur Foundation uh, uh, means that I believe that uh, to solve the social problem, we need entrepreneurship. <coughs> so we need to use the entrepreneurship to solve social problem, uh, that's why we call our foundation a social entrepreneur foundation. And uh, the short name, uh, you change, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, the similar uh, pronunciation like uh, Chinese Yu Cheng, our name of foundation. So we use you change as our short name, and it means we are change maker. So uh, <coughs> we are an uh, independent uh, private foundation uh, to, to improve the social innovation and, and to as a platform. Okay, that's the first data we, uh, we have done since uh, 2007. Uh, at the beginning, we are the first to introduce social innovation and social enterprise to China. And uh, that's uh, seven years ago. And uh, four years ago, uh, we initiated <laughs> seven trends of new philanthropy uh, under the new social, economic, uh, and the technological condition. Uh, and then last year, we uh, initiate a new philanthropy concept to invest area to become a, 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 a we advocate social impact investing. 
And this year, we developed the social innovation uh, standards for three, that's three A I will introduce. So in order to, so that's what uh, we have done during the seven years, supporting four, uh, 148 uh, fledgling nonprofit and uh, R&D and pilot uh, programs like this. So uh, that's, uh, we are uh, advocating social innovation in investing field. Uh, we get the support from uh, Blair. We, that's the... Okay, that? so here's the, so, so this is um, the introduction for the organization. So you can make your opening comments following this now. Okay. So this is just the organizational introduction. So hopefully you have a good understanding of DASRA, of China Social Entrepreneur Foundation. I want to take a quick uh, test with the audience. I'd like to know by show of hands, how many of you consider your companies new to giving in China? So new could be one or two years, you're exploring new strategies, you haven't been there many years, or you haven't given yet, but you know it's coming. So new to giving in China. A small handful, so split 50-50. And how many would put yourselves in the new category for giving in India? Maybe one or two years, a little bit of activity, but not a lot. Okay, even less. So maybe more activity in India, a little bit less in China. I think that's good for us to understand that the majority of the room has some activity there, some quite experienced likely. I'd also like to know from the audience, I'm just going to take two or three if people can say, um, what were some things you were really hoping to learn from this session? Um, that we can put those out right in front before the speakers are giving their opening comments. So anybody can put out just two or three right here. I, Jeff? I, I think in China, the, the view of the government of the organizations that we're coming in and working with <coughs> is that welcome and accepting, if there are certain parameters that the government's going to look for so that we don't actually step on toes on the public sector side while forming a partnership with NGO. OK, others that are interested in government role in China, just show of hands. Some hands, OK. Uh, I'll take two more. So uh, an element of how people are um, carrying out any new strategies related to the law, specifically whether they're giving from headquarters or actually giving locally. And one more. Any other burning questions right here? Yeah, just um, you saw when you were in the States the value of um, donated products and non-cash, just wonder how well that kind of I think this is really good to do sort of at the beginning so we can get a sense um, of what's on your minds and our panelists can focus their comments where possible to some of the questions that you have, although we'll do a longer Q&A towards the end. Um, so we'd like now to give you both some opportunity to make some opening comments um, in general about probably in your case table the law, the impact you think you have. Um, on helping companies apply it, also you know, what has changed in the NGO sector, but just some sort of general comments and advice you can give to the audience related to the topic. Great. Um, so as, as you guys know, from April 1st of this year, a law was enacted mandating that all companies um, that have profits of over $833,000 a year or 50 million rupees are mandated now by law to give 2% of their net profits uh, to charitable activities. Um, similar to the US and India, we have organizations that are registered under different laws, but they sort of mimic the 501c3 uh, that focus on alleviation of poverty or women's rights or uh, malnutrition and other social issues that uh, come under this law. So organizations or companies, I guess, could fund existing entities, uh, they can create something on their own which sort of compile, uh, comply by sort of the seven to eight areas that the government has mandated as uh, being allowed. And uh, the government also has said that uh, companies could give to the Prime Minister's Fund, uh, which then <laughs> supports different activities which we have very little clue on actually what happens post that. Um, but but that's, that option is there. I think the change that this has really created is um, you know, we have had companies uh, and many industry leaders, such as the Tatas, for example, who've been giving towards charity for over 100 years. And they've been giving much larger than 2%. In fact, uh, over 70 to 80% of their entire company holdings actually lie in trusts. 
So you have sort of uh, companies that are large family foundations who've been doing this from day one, yet really the goal, I think, of the law was to have uh, other companies to start abiding by this. And I think in doing so, we, we're seeing shifts where um, for, for many companies, I guess, CSR was more of an afterthought, uh, something that honestly seven or eight individuals are, are complied to or sort of put on a committee, they meet every three months and they make these decisions. I think after this law, because the, the quantum of funds is so much greater, you're actually now having senior decision makers participating in these conversations. And, and we're hoping then it's more aligned to the business interest. So like we saw with direct relief earlier today in FedEx, ideally looking at the core competencies of the business and the shared value proposition, and then sort of moving forward with these type of activities. Um, that being said, the Indian government, as of now at least, the laws are fairly strict. So you cannot have a business value proposition in implementing this law. Uh, so it has to be uh, you know, very different than acquiring clients for your business. That being said, you can leverage your core competencies like we've seen other companies in the US and, and, and in other places do. Um, I think in India, these laws, once they're passed, it takes actually a couple of years for them to be implemented. Um, we see multinational corporations and family businesses in India that have a strong standing and brand reputation probably being the first to abide by these laws because we, we just are assuming that the media after sort of uh, it's time to report, which is about a year from now, the media will probably go after these companies first because their records uh, can potentially be tarnished if they don't abide by these laws. And over time, you'll see sort of the small and medium enterprises sort of following suit. Perfect. So actually, if I can ask you a follow-up uh, right away, you mentioned that you think that the um, multinationals will be some of the first to abide by the law. Can you talk a little bit more about why you think that is and how that might change um, the interpretation of the law and the implementation sort of for years to come? Sure. Well, I mean, I guess what people many times don't realize, even in India, um, is that um, in terms of our tax bases, 3% of our population uh, earn enough money in India to actually pay income tax and 700 million individuals earn less than $5 a day. And, and if anyone has taken an economics class, clearly there is a role for private philanthropy to play uh, an active uh, sort of participation in sort of uplifting individuals out of poverty. I think with that in mind, uh, again, the large family businesses or the multinationals, I think, understand that it is in their best interest to uplift the communities that they serve and profit from. Um, where I think a lot of the small and medium enterprises uh, may not necessarily go down this path because shareholders are not necessarily looking at their books. Uh, and so the law actually states that in your annual report, you have to declare whether or not you've given the 2%. And if not, you actually have to give reasons of why you did not give that 2%. There is no penalty for not giving the 2%, but there's a penalty for not actually talking about this on your annual report and on your website. So again, those companies that have strong brand reputations are the ones who are going to ensure that they follow by these laws. Whereas, like I said, many small and medium enterprises who are not necessarily affected by an annual report, especially if they're not even public, probably they're not going to be as phased. And they will just say in their annual report that we didn't abide by it because this was not the right time. Yeah. I think it's quite an interesting point you raise. It's something that is a, a nuance of the law people talk more about now, which is that the transparency element, the reporting rep uh, element, is what's the requirement. And the 2% is not, as you said, there's no penalty if it's not met. However, having the reporting requirement in place obviously allows the public. We've heard a lot in more opening sessions about transparency and how that's ever increasing, and the public is much more engaged. And so it seems that that would be sort of the, the way that it could be policed. Um, so thank you for that opening comment. I'd like to ask um, Nader if you could flip to the second presentation for us. Um, and Ms. Wang, if you could please now, we'll uh, have your slides. Um, and we'd love for you to make some opening comments on what you think uh, the market in China, how it has changed, the most important places for companies to give. Um, and uh, we have a large uh, deck. She's going to be kind of jumping through and selecting uh, the most important slides to go through. So let's see if I can get thank you to where you need to go. Is this the other one? Uh, yes, OK. So uh, as a, we in focus on the social impact investing and, uh, or uh, social uh, philanthropy. Uh, so, but uh, we, we need uh, standards. So that's why we, we create uh, this 
three A standards. That's uh, uh, one is the aim, that's motivation. Uh, and the second approach is uh, innovation for effective philanthropy. The, the third A is action sustainability. Because that's uh, what we uh, uh, create the criteria. Oh. So uh, now regarding uh, the field of China, so uh, you, you can see widespread environmental pollution aging society and uh, so on. So you can see I, 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 for the time saving, I, I will not uh, read all of them. The social organization in China, uh, by the end of 2012, so it's a significantly increased. Uh, the foundation, the numbers of foundations increased because a lot of uh, <coughs> private uh, uh, enterprise, uh, they set up their own foundations. Uh, for the government, the government highly restricted uh, the foundation, but uh, 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 for the registered, at the beginning, they are poorly managing, but now they become a uh, stimulate the very the vitality of social organization, so improve a lot uh, as a social uh, as a social management. Uh, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a new progress from China to opening up, but still they have a lot of inside restriction. The new trends in cooperation philanthropy, uh, uh, apart from massive donation, so uh, some of the, uh, not only private uh, enterprise in China, but also multinational companies began to set up their own foundations like BMW and uh, Anway. And uh, more and more pro bono service uh, in China began. And uh, we have, uh, Cooperated with uh, McKinsey and so on. They do a lot of pro bono service. And CSR <laughs> integrate to business cooperation like Nike and uh, Tom's. So that's the charitable donation in China. So you can see uh, the same as what we said uh, on the last session. It's education uh, almost the first and second poverty deviation. So. Uh, what we say is that we advocate, advocate new philanthropy because we don't think uh, uh, only resources plus project or money giving is not a, a solving problem, not necessarily uh, uh, have social impact, maybe sometimes not efficient. So in China, uh, we, uh, we can see this flat, this blue, resources flow uh, has uh, some problem of uh, facility or have some problem of uh, make full use of the resources. That's why you change foundation, uh, create a platform to help the effective giving. So the giving, the resources from government, business, academia, public media, and individual. So we, we made uh, criteria to let these resources to go directly to the more uh, efficient organization uh, to choose the more efficient uh, solution. So that's what we say uh, social change, social impact. So we have made this chart uh, to show this uh, new philanthropy emphasize to create of social value. So this horizontal, uh, this uh, uh, vertical and horizontal uh, show that the traditional one, the traditional charity and uh, philanthropy and the new philanthropy are different social impact because China has a very short tradition, short period uh, to have this, develop this uh, philanthropy. So we need to do this uh, advocate, let them know uh, what's the social impact and uh, not only give money, simply. So that's why 
we make this. So that uh, means the social issues, and this uh, uh, means the total solution, whether it's a, system, a, uh, it's a systematic solution we have. So with the public issues and uh, the total solution, we can create more impact or more, more social value. So that's the progress we think in China we are, we are leading or we advocate at this uh, different stage uh, from uh, 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0. We think that's the social innovation and we hope we encourage social, uh, social change maker. So, uh, so from new philanthropy to new CSR, that's what I suggest, because this is a, a discussion about CSR. So, so solving social problem by so, social entrepreneurship. And the social problem was, uh, so what's real social pro problem? How to definite social problem? We have so many problem, environment problem and uh, aging, Problem and so on, and po poverty. But uh, uh, all of them re re relevant to these things. Uh, equity, I mean, uh, equal access. And efficiency, I mean, effective resources allocation. And the sustainability, that is long-term solution without new problem creation. So we need to solve these three problems. And, uh, for these three problems, uh, that is the social innovation, I think. So how to create real social value? I, I, I think CSR should, should also to choose the, like this. Uh, this is three standards I already mentioned, the aim, approach, and action as a, uh, uh, criteria to find your cooperator, to design your projects in China. I think that we suggest. Uh, so to whom to, cl cl uh, to collaborate with? That we, we discuss the what and the why and the how and now who. A social innovation support platform, you change foundation. <laughs> and uh, we have done much on social innovation R&D, uh, piloting and uh, funding and uh, advocacy. Ms. Wang, I'll actually ask you to pause there. I'd actually like to ask you a question, mm -hmm. if I can. Um, when you're talking about who to partner with, one of our companies asked, can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the role of government? How important is it that the NGO a company partners with has a strong government relationship? Yes, uh, the government relationship is still very important because uh, we have still a lot of restriction uh, to re register the organization. But uh, uh, gradually, uh, they will become uh, easier. Uh, I, during the time, you need to find uh, the better channel. The channel, I mean, also the partner the local partner who had a better relationship with government. So that's what I think is uh, okay. um, important. Actually, and I, uh, I think that um, that's a really important question. I wonder if you can expand a little bit. If the, if the company selects an organization to partner with that doesn't have a strong government relationship, will that affect their business? Yes. <laughs> Please expand. <laughs> How so? Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah, because uh, as a NGO, a small uh, NGO organization, they have, uh, uh, if they want to do something in the local community, they have to deal with the local government. And uh, they have to uh, get the help from the foundation. And the foundation, you know, many, most of the foundation they can uh, register, most of them has some relationship with China, with, with the Chinese government. Uh, of course, you can do uh, with the 
grassroots uh, organization. Uh, but normally, they are very small and uh, very uh, few of uh, talent uh, workers and uh, not very efficient. Yeah, sometimes that's the problem. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to think of. Um, Carrie, do you have any follow up? I do. So, um, related to working with an organization <coughs> that has a relationship with the government, and I understand being registered as a charity, but having an ongoing, whether it's management <coughs> or implementation of their programs with the government, some of our So the question is, it's not just about is the NGO registered, it's also about does the NGO have ongoing relationship with the government, correct? Right, because, yes, in the U.S. there's compliance issues related to whether the NGO has that relationship. Uh, yeah, uh, not only register, but uh, uh, when you implement uh, your uh, project, you need to go into the uh, community. So uh, community access also uh, had uh, some uh, uh, government uh, engaged in. So we need to like allow us to do what we, we want to do. Uh, so normally, the Chinese government uh, was happy to if you just give the uh, resources and money, and material, uh, especially during the uh, disaster. So uh, just to do some. Uh, Unity development, you really find a local Sure. So I think right now, um, and the law, like I said, it's just been passed, and, and so it's really applicable for this fiscal year, ending March 31st, uh, 2015. And, and so I think um, you are seeing um, international companies sort of plugging the gap, so to speak, and providing the funds. But then again, in the annual report, they will say that while we didn't give X amount uh, directly, i.e. the local company didn't, we were able to bring X, you know, Y amount from, from the headquarters. Uh, but, but I think in the long run, um, the local entity is the one who needs to actually be showing that these funds have gone from their books. Uh, now, I think many of the companies here, for example, I'm sure, may be doing much more than the 2%. I mean, earlier today I was speaking to, to an organization, to a company, um, and, and they were saying for tax purposes, uh, they don't necessarily have that much profits on their books in India. That being said, at a, at a global level, they are very, very profitable. And, and therefore, the sort of the global level comes in and provides this kind of support. So I'm sure that will happen. The law right now is just how much the legal entity in that country actually makes. Um, you also in India have, for example, in banking uh, due to regulations, many times a bank will have five or six different entities, legal entities that they've had to set up. Um, and, and so within that, uh, there is the benefit or the potential of pooling that capital together amongst the five or six entities. Uh, but let's say three entities were profitable and three were not. You can't actually have a cumulative number where you can offset losses from one company to the next. Uh, so it has to be, you know, the profit of each individual company, but they all, the funds then can be actually uh, sort of disseminated to one organization and, and, you know, the pooling of capital is allowed from that perspective. In terms of non-cash, um, in India currently at least the law does not allow tax deductions uh, for in-kind donations. And, and so if you're giving computers or, or, or hardware or software, et cetera, there is actually no tax deduction that you can get from that. Um, and, and so that's probably one of the reasons why in India uh, you do not have as much in-kind donation as you have, for example, here in the U.S. Uh, that being said, we are seeing sort of a pickup of um, companies sort of, you know, offering their products or services at a lower cost basis. 
realizing that the price to pay uh, for certain markets is much lower than typically you find in, in, in urban India. Um, and you're slowly seeing now uh, companies trying to figure out how they can harness their professional skills and bring that to the table. So Dasra has been working with Vodafone, for example, for a number of years now, enabling them to execute a World of Difference program where they give their staff two months paid leave to bring their professional skills to these nonprofit organizations. And so you're seeing slowly sort of that happening. But again, the law is not clear on how you can monetize that in terms of the 2% yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one thing that impressed me um, while I was there learning from companies is that there really is a, a very strong volunteering movement and pro bono movement beginning um, and that it is developing and I think as the implementation goes forward with the law, companies will lead in how they determine the valuation and what will count towards that 2%. So I think there's, there's some possibilities and some opportunities there, although obviously the tax implications all sort of run in the background. Um, Ms. Wang, I'd love to know, uh, similarly in China, are, do companies often also include product donation, in-kind donation, and are NGOs interested in having that type of donation? I Probably disasters, but even beyond that. Yeah, they like donation. Like, uh, you know, uh, they simply give money. They, they, they are more happy. But uh, I uh, think that the more and more organizations, they need a more uh, pro bono uh, uh, capacity building and uh, uh, Give some uh, seeds fund to the uh, to incubate uh, so social enterprise and uh, to to help them to learn some uh, uh, how to do business because social business they, they could be NGOs and they do not know how to do it so a lot of work a lot of uh, topics they need to to be helped uh, by uh, uh, pro bono. I think that's a great point because I think um, corporate funders have the role of providing the funding for the programs they support and the cause areas they support, but as you speak about pro bono, it's also about developing the NGO sector, yeah. allowing them to build their capacity yeah. and expand their work. So yes. um, that's a great point. I know another really common question that we hear is uh, at headquarters, a company may have identified uh, a short list of very important cause areas. Um, I would select the example of STEM education because it's so um, such an important issue right now for so many companies that's science, technology, engineering, and math education. And companies are investing very heavily in that. So when they come to a new market like China or India, how do they adjust? How do they take maybe a, a cause area that they have invested in heavily and consider how that should play out in a new country like India or China? Devil, you want to take that first? Sure. So, so I think um, one of the things one, of course, has to look at is the cultural context. And so for in India, for example, uh, the number one reason why girls drop out of school is lack of toilets. And so you have a large percentage of girls dropping out usually in sixth or seventh grade uh, because there are no toilets once they, once they reach puberty. And so while STEM, of course, is extremely important uh, and continuing education is extremely important, many times people and companies don't realize sitting here or outside of India that there actually are other issues that perhaps need to be looked at. Uh, and if you have you know, X percentage of your population that's actually dropping out of school, then the quality of education in 10th grade when only a small percentage is even able to attend 10th grade uh, there's an issue. And, and so I think many times uh, companies have to sort of rethink and perhaps go earlier down uh, the value chain, so to speak, and, and figure out what are some of these root causes. Um, and I think that's at, at times difficult when you know, decisions are, for example, being made here on college star scholarships. And of course, that's very important. But again, in India, most, I mean, I think it's one out of every hundred girls actually are able to attend school up to college. And so there are other underlying issues that probably need uh, to be looked at. Uh, you know, toilets in general, and uh, you know, we have more cell phone penetration in India than toilet penetration. And I think, you know, again, close to 60% of our population do not even have access to toilets. And while that may seem something that why would a corporate care about, um, there's of course the dignity element, but again, it affects schools, it affects women, because typically they actually cannot use the restroom post four in the morning. Uh, so the health issues that then emerge, the sexual harassment that emerges as they defecate in public, and there's a whole host of issues, again, that uh, are particular to India. Uh, another topic we've been speaking quite a bit about, and I think at a global level, child marriage. 
And you know, when, when children get married and, and mothers or, or girls actually at the age of 12, 13, and 14 are having babies, uh, they put their life at risk. And you know, we have 56,000 women who die every single year in India during childbirth. Majority of them are adolescent girls. Uh, and the flip side of that or sort of is that the children, um, we have 1,600 children dying every single day in India under the age of five, again, because of a lack of sanitary conditions as well as the health of their mother. And so what could be issues here in the US, such as STEM, which is extremely important, there could be other issues in India that you may want to start looking at solving. Um, and, and it's, I think, important for you know, philanthropy, whether it's from a corporate or a high net worth individual, or even governments for that matter, to sort of go into those directions as well. Um, before I respond, I'd like to allow you, uh, Ms. Wang, to... Yeah, I think China's problems are not as same as India. And uh, I think China, uh, the, the most important uh, issue is to lack of uh, uh, innovation. Uh, it's a, it's a like drive because uh, uh, we have a, a lot of uh, economic uh, infrastructure, but the lack of uh, social infrastructure. So that's why I support you to, uh, to give the donation and uh, to give support to uh, this area you mentioned. So I, I, I think that's the fundamental. Uh, not only give the simple gift money uh, or uh, poverty alleviation or uh, disaster alleviation. That's my opinion. So I think if I were to translate uh, both of those responses, it may be that the long-term objective um, of certain focus areas is maintained, but dialing it back in the local context, like our most important pressing need are root causes related to whatever the focus area might be. So the strategy is long-term, it can maintain the perhaps corporate you know, uh, strategies and focus areas, but understanding the local context is very important. So. We'd like to give the table time to talk, but before we do, I'd like to ask um, if you can share your opinion or something a little bit more hot button, but what would you say is maybe the biggest pitfall you've seen of Western funders? It can be your opinion or an example of entering the Indian or the Chinese market. We'll keep going in our same Sure, way. sure. No, no, yeah. So I think, uh, I think you hit it you know, with the last question. I think, again, understanding the culture context is critical. I think also uh, picking local players is, is, is really important. And, and so many times organizations uh, try to sort of you know, start and own and operate their models from day one, not realizing that typically it takes five to seven years to create behavioral change uh, and then actually have these individuals access the services or products that you're trying to deliver. So I think funding these local players, focusing on capacity building support, um, I think is really critical because you need to build institutions in these countries and I think the long-term perspective that many of you guys have in your business world, if you can bring that to the nonprofit world, ideally that enables these organizations to really grow and scale versus each year look for additional funds because it's sort of short-term commitments that are project-based versus institutional focused. Okay. Uh, I think uh, most of the uh, multinational corporation uh, CSR in China is, uh, is good. Uh, uh, what they lack of, uh, uh, normally they lack of uh, channels uh, they choose the partners uh, with only what they, uh, the old face. I think uh, the gongo or famous uh, uh, actor or some, some, uh, something like that. So I suggest you uh, do some research on the partners uh, to choose them uh, to cooperate. And, uh, and a, good, a good example, uh, uh, Tom, uh, Tom's, uh, they, they, uh, they donate uh, 400,000 uh, pairs of shoes every year in China, cooperate with, with us. Uh, but this is a very traditional uh, donation, uh, no creation. But uh, because of the co cooperate with us, we have volunteer station. We uh, recruit a lot of volunteers, uh, to, uh, a big uh, uh, amount of people to, to join it, to participate. And we developed uh, uh, this program into a community development and, uh, and make it a long-term uh, uh, project. So uh, that's what I think, you know, to choose the best partner, uh, to have the channel to go to the community side. That's what I think. I think uh, you're both talking a lot about kind of connecting with local partners. Last year at the summit, we talked a lot about structure and process for international giving in a session. We found that most companies are still 
uh, heavily reliant on what we might call intermediaries or pass-through organizations or NGOs with an international footprint. And I think the reason that is is because there's potential risk to making some, some local partnerships. Um, one thing we're doing is sessions like this to learn more. We've also got a handout that we can give to everyone as they leave with some local resources to try to help break down some of those ba barriers of finding local partners, because sometimes that can be the biggest challenge. Um, so, but thank you both for being here and, and already 